Welcome back to a piece of theme park content where if you want it to last four hours, you're probably just going to have to play it five or six times. Uh, this is the Coaster 101 podcast. I'm Andrew Stillwell, and joining me this week all the way down in Orlando is Shane Joseph. Shane, what's up? It's been a long time. I know. It's been a while, but uh, I've uh, I've been busy, and I'm excited to talk about uh, everything that I've been busy with doing. I was gonna say I've been I've been busy too. It's a lot less fun busy than uh, you <laughs> you've been you've been gallivanting all around the uh, Greater Orlando area, and you uh, yeah yeah you know. In the words of Adam Sandler in the film Big Daddy, while he was trick or treating with uh, what was who was the kangaroo? He was like the he was the kangaroo from the kangaroo song. But we got a first timer out here, Shane. You know, yes, been, we do. We've been writing. You have been writing for Coaster One Hundred One um, for five six years at this point you've been a roller coaster yep. fan your whole life but you have finally made your first ever trip to america's rock and roller coast in sandusky <laughs> ohio cedar point. yes i did yep i did three and days at cedar point three whole days and this is a trip obviously you had planned well in advance and as of this recording you have uh, just missed I, you know, they've started testing Top Thrill 2, so we'll get that. Oh, I know. If you want to talk about Top Thrill, if you want to hear about Top Thrill 2, we had a previous episode with both Nick and Kyle, uh, who were there at Media Day. So give, go give that a listen. But Shane, you know, we're roller coaster fans. We know that yes, you we know, are. Th- there are several theme park meccas in the United States. You know, there's Six Flags yep. Magic Mountain. There's Hershey Park. There's cedar point i mean these are these are places that are you know they have does you know over a dozen coasters they're known for their roller coaster collection what what let's dive right in i guess what did you all right let's do what it were your, what were your first thoughts i mean it, let's not even back it up to the front gate driving across that that causeway yeah. in that peninsula what what's going through your head uh, I mean, it was all just kind of surreal. Like it's one of those things where, especially as an enthusiast, like you see hundreds of thousands of pictures like all the time. And it's just uh, – Cedar Point, I feel like even more than like Magic Mountain or Hershey Park, Cedar Point has this sort of um, mythic uh, energy when people talk about it. It's, it's kind of revered as this uh, sort of – I mean, like you said, it's like a, a, you know, a pilgrimage to go there and it's like a notable event when you do. So it just had been built up so much as this sort of mysticism around it that actually seeing it was, was a a pretty hard to believe. I love that. And, you know, you come across that causeway, you go park in the parking lot and it's been five or so years since I've been to Cedar Point, definitely pre COVID. Um, but you know, you see Gatekeeper. What you get to the park? What what were you riding first? What did you make a beeline towards uh, once you got? Uh, in well, the actually, we after I came across the uh, causeway, it was like ten thirty p.m. So nothing, oh. nothing on uh, when that happened. Um, but uh, yeah, I, we stayed at Hotel Breakers. That was our first stop. But then the next day. Uh, our first stop because we had the early entry was to Millennium Force okay. because that's one of the couple things that are open. So that was definitely like the most popular. It was really that and Gatekeeper, which were the two big uh, heavy hitters for early entry. So uh, we went straight to Millennium Force. And driving around two hotel breakers, if I remember correctly, you go right under a right next to, but under. I mean, that's how height works. Uh, the the lift hill of Millennium Force. So. It's another one of those coasters. It's a bucket list coaster for so many people. Yes. And still after almost 25 years is in a lot of global top five lists and a lot of people's number one or, you know, top five coaster. what did you think of Millennium Force? Um, well, because of everything you just said, uh, I was a little disappointed with Millennium Force, uh, especially because growing up, my local uh, giant Intamin was a Superman at Six Flags New England. Uh, So I think I went in anticipating the same sensation of that, which is like crazy eject your airtime and, uh, you know, pushed into your seat positive. That's not what Millennium Force is. And 
if I had gone in with the correct expectations, I don't think I would have been as disappointed. Um, but really, I mean, Millennium Force to me is all about the speed. It's really the height too. The height and the speed, obviously, uh, it was the first coaster to break that 300 foot record, if it, meaning continuous layout, because there were others that that did. But uh, you know, obviously, because of that, it has this um, kind of legendary status. But to me, the highlight is the speed, especially in the front row, because my first ride was in the back row. So I didn't even really experience the best element of it. But um, when I came to ride it later, I really appreciated what that speed, I mean, you really, there's only a few other coasters that, that I feel like you can truly feel that like 90, I think it's 92 miles per hour for Millennium Force. So uh, yeah, I think that the first shop is great. Uh, and I mean, this is the case with a lot of Cedar Point coasters because of where they're located, but being on that beach and looking out over the water, uh, you know, the lift hill it is literally like going parallel with the, uh, lakes there. So yeah, uh, after I got over that first experience, I definitely came to like it better. Yeah. I'm kind of with you. I feel like, and again, it's been several years since I rode Millennium Force and maybe I just have this just anti intimate giga because i'm not the world's <laughs> biggest um intimidator slash project 305 fan oh um, yeah well see i am I, that's my number one coaster so it, it's i don't know i i get what you're saying the speed is great and everyone was like this is this mind-blowing coaster and i mean you can call me a carowinds or a fury or b&m homer if you <laughs> want to but i just think fury does everything millennium force does has the speed, has the air time. It it does it, and it does it a little bit better. But there's nothing I wrong agree. with it. I th- no, there's not. And it's good for what it is. But, I mean, based on what, what you just said, I think that there is one better Blue Giga in the state of Ohio, uh, which is Orion at Kings Island. Uh, bec- for what you just said, I, I just think there's more interesting elements uh, on B&M Gigas. And I, I think that it's also... I mean, like I just said, this was the first one. So I think right. they they didn't really – they haven't reached the level that they have now where they kind of know what to expect. I really think, honestly, that they were just building it to see, like, can we even do this? Can we build a 300-foot giga coaster? And they did it. Uh, but, I mean, again, like what you just said, I'm sure when it opened, it was, it was legendary and blew people's minds. Uh, but now I think really probably because of Millennium Force, uh, it has just led to even more innovation and uh, even more great giga coasters and even hyper coasters from India. Yes. Well, on the subject of innovation and hyper coasters, you can't go to Cedar Point unless you're me uh, without taking a spin on uh, Steel Vengeance. Um, you know, oh, yeah. I know you're you've got a couple of RMCs under your belt at this point. Um, but, yes. You know. What did you think of uh, Steel Vengeance and how how did it compare to other RMCs that you've ridden? So uh, Steel Vengeance, of course, with Top Thrill 2 being closed, was the biggest draw for our trip. It was definitely the thing I was most excited about. I love RMC. I have a couple RMCs in my top 10. Uh, you know, I have Iron Gwazi pretty close by here, which is another uh, hyper hybrid from RMC. So I sort of thought that I knew what to expect because of that. Uh, but still, again, I mean, a, a, if you're talking about rides that have created a, a buzz in the coaster community, there, Steel Vengeance is it. Steel Vengeance is the top, the, the most hyped coaster maybe ever. If you've never been like me, it's, it's, it's a majority of coaster enthusiasts, number one coaster. So there was definitely a lot of hype and there was a lot of, room to be disappointed because of that but every time i hit the break run on still vengeance i had the same thought which is i think this is the greatest roller coaster ever built <laughs> and i mean every single element on still vengeance is unbelievably good and the best thing about it is that you feel like it is it never ends i did still vengeance nine times over the course of those three days and every time I was surprised at the length of it. It is, it is super long. I'm so mad. You know, when we were there for coaster, what's their coaster event? Coaster mania. Yeah. I think right. So. Yeah. 
we were there for Coaster Mania the year it opened. We had ERT. I was getting ready to ride in the front row, and I got walked because oh. the restraint wouldn't come down. At the bottom. Yeah. I mean, it was right there on the border. And mm-hmm. I'm kicking myself and have been for five or six years at this point because I've not been to Cedar Point since. But I'm so jealous of everybody who gets to ride this ride just because yeah. the, the the hype. The hype is real. Yeah. I mean it's the like hype every, is real. It's real, but it's deserved hype. You know, there there are other yes. characters out there. Yes, it is. That, so I'm you know, I'm glad you had a good time. I'm I'm still mad that I didn't get to ride it, but you know, we like we were talking before the uh the podcast. We've got to get back up there. Uh correct. Now you have a reason to go back. I've always had a reason to go back and you yeah. Know, <laughs> yeah. Eventually there will be a uh, two 420 foot tall structure reason to go back here too. But yes. Hopefully like very, maybe by the time this comes out, who knows? Hope so. Maybe we'll see. I don't know. I yeah. don't know when this is going to come out. That's the good question. I just got to end yeah. it. Um, All right, there we go. I want to talk, uh, get your thoughts. And I mean, we're going to, we're not going to go coaster by coaster here. But I okay. want your I want your thoughts on my two favorite Cedar Point coasters, which are favorites for different reasons. Okay, First, what are they? Let's talk Maverick. Maverick, I think is oh, my yeah. of coasters at Cedar Point. I think it is my favorite. Yes, Maverick was a ride that I was incredibly excited to do because it is essentially a combination of my three favorite coasters, which are Intimidator 305, Skyrush, uh, and Velocicoaster with a little Cheetah Hunt mixed in there as well. So I my anticipation was incredibly high, and I was still blown away. Uh, first, my first ride on Maverick was in the front row, and after that I knew it was good. But then after a back row ride, I knew it was like legendary good i because this is one where i mean you have a park with still vengeance in it and top thrill 2 in it so maverick is kind of sidelined i think a lot of the time when you're talking about those but it, i mean this ride is unbelievable and I, I i didn't know anything about it i don't think i mean i'm sure i've seen a pov at some point but i nothing that i committed to memory so pretty much everything was a surprise to me but I didn't know that another coaster could have the uh, snaps that Intimidator 305 has. And that second launch. I, well, okay, first, I have a lot to say about Maverick. Go ahead. Um, I, have the, I have the T-shirt, like you always say. If, it's, if you have the T-shirt, it's, it's a good sign. Um, the first drop on Maverick is unbelievable, in the back especially. Uh, it's the only thing for me that uh, that is up there with Skyrush as the best first drops, I think, because this one, a lot of coasters have beyond 90 degree drops, even a couple at Cedar Point. But this Maverick is the really the only one that I feel like really uses the beyond 90 degrees. I mean, you really feel it because those trains are so short. Uh, if you're in the back, you're just getting whipped over that thing. Uh, and then, I mean, the snaps and then the uh, Stengel dives, I think they're called in the second half. I mean, that's some of the strongest, not even airtime, but strongest coaster elements that I've ever felt. I mean, it's so whippy. And then that second launch, 70, I, I couldn't believe, they were saying like before they dispatched the trains, they were like, get ready to go 70 miles an hour. And I couldn't believe that. I, I had never, I guess, heard that or realized that it went that fast. Uh, and the genius thing about this layout is the second launch is pretty much completely hidden, even from the sound, because it's in sort of a tunnel. So if you were just observing the coaster, you would not know that it's there. And the speed of it is incredible. And then right after coming out of the launch, you do this this tight left-hand turn into that big hill with the trim brakes on it. Uh, and it's just, again, the sensation and the whippiness was uh, just fantastic. So yeah, long story short, Maverick was everything I hoped it would be and even more. I love how whippiness is like, it's a term that is coaster enthusiasts. We all know, but it's yes. also like a word that's not real and doesn't exist. It's not a real exactly, word. We know exactly no. what you're talking about. 
Yeah. So my other my other favorite coaster at Cedar Point. This is a, I feel like is going to be a sleeper pick for a lot of people. Gemini. Oh yes, I, I, I love that coaster so much. Maybe because it's the you know the OG high the OG hybrid coaster, the steel track on the wooden yeah. supports, <laughs> yeah. the racing, the high fives, how smooth it is. What do you think of Gemini? So I had a, uh, we'll say interesting experience with Gemini because my first ride uh, was in the back row on the blue side. Uh, and I got off the ride with a headache and I said, I will not ride that again. That was the roughest coaster experience I've ever had. But you have to get both credits because it is two credits in case anyone was wondering. So I had to do the red side uh, and it was significantly better. I mean, night and day better. Uh, so I wrote it multiple more times uh, in the front row as well, which is just way smoother and experience as well. Uh, but it really grew on me. Just I just had a terrible impression <laughs> with that first one. Uh, but every time after that was great. Okay. All right. It's, see, it's, it is tough, you know, especially with those racing coasters that have dual, you know, two tracks. One, yeah. they're, they claim to be identical, but with for one to be so much better, I think that's a really, that's a pretty interesting thought. But yeah, again, I mean, within, even, even within the train though, like the front row on the blue side was fine. So I don't know what was, maybe I just got a weird, weird day. I don't know. The wheel, wheel didn't warm up enough or something, but uh, but I did want to say something else because of the high fiving. That is just such a cool. I mean, a lot of coasters, especially like recent ones, if they're racing or dueling, will have a what they call a high five moment. But you can't actually touch the other riders. You can on Gemini. You can full on like high five or hold hands with somebody on the other train, which is just a crazy fun. I mean, that first of all, that would never happen on a coaster that is built today. Just the ability to be like going over a big turn and actually like high fiving someone on another train is just so cool. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know. You're probably not supposed to do it, but it's also one of those things like, I mean, maybe not, but you know, coaster opened in 1978 and, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a far less litigious time. Um, in, yes. In that, that era of the world. Um, Couple, I mean, we, again, we don't need to go coaster by coaster here. What were some other uh, coaster highlights of your your time at Cedar Point? You know, Val Ravens there, um, uh, yeah. Gatekeeper. We mentioned like, what are some what were some of your other favorites? Definitely, Gatekeeper. Um, I loved. I wasn't sure because this was uh, Gatekeeper was my first B and M wing coaster. Believe that or not, so uh, I really didn't know what to expect, which is rare. Uh, you know, when you've been a fan, as long as we have to have an experience that you genuinely don't know what it's going to feel like or what to expect from it. And that was gatekeeper for me. I was especially, I was actually nervous, which doesn't happen on a lot of coasters either, uh, for that, a giant wing over drop inversion. Um, because one of the things that really scares me on coasters is the hang time. So the idea of being, uh, it f what feels like so separate from the track because you're off to the side and then being on that outside seat, just being slowly rotated over the top. Uh, I was nervous, but ended up just being, uh, an absolute blast. Um, and gatekeeper was one of the ones that on our third day, the park was, was pretty dead. It was very crowded the first two days. So on the third day, it was nice to get a break from that. And gatekeeper had pretty much no line. So, uh, we just, lapped it just five times in a row between the front and the back row. Uh, I think gatekeeper is really underrated, to be honest. The inversions are so much fun. Uh, another one that's, I mean, gatekeeper is quite literally on the beach. So you can, uh, the, the views are unbelievable there. Um, the elements are fun. Uh, after the mid-course break run is, is sort of uh, the only part of the ride that's kind of lackluster. But everything else, I, uh, I was just very surprised because I didn't really have expectations for. So I ended up really liking it. Yeah. Gatekeeper for me, I will always remember it was the last ride we had at Coaster Mania. I'd been at the park for like 17 hours at that point because it was like one in the morning. Oh, wow. And I caught a whiff of something coming off the bay, some sort of seaweed or some sort of stench and it okay. just it stuck with me and it was the worst smell i've ever smelled <laughs> and i was 
on this ride and i again had been riding coasters all day yeah insides were a little jostled my head was probably spinning and i was just like i can't ride another coaster right now i'm I'm just like this is it it was the sensory overload on gatekeeper that's one it was just like oh it's so (laughs) like i don't get i don't get motion sickness you know very much but that one was one i was like i very wow i'm about to lose it but i didn't so okay that was good um val raven is is another one i feel like that a lot of people sleep on because it's like oh it's another dive coaster but yeah um, i think that's a great it's a great fun coaster and i think fits in that section of cedar point perfectly yeah i agree i think a dive coaster i'm always a fan of dive coasters and i think they're pretty much a, i feel like a dive coaster could go in pretty much any park uh because it offers kind of a unique sensation obviously with the holding break there yeah uh i only did it once uh just because the the line was always long val raven is uh, definitely a big people magnet just because it's it's huge it's right at the front of the park it has a kind of eye-catching uh feature so uh, i was impressed with it i think the first drop was really good as are all dive coaster drops um but i really that last inversion i don't even know what it's called uh but it's a slow inversion and that's what i liked about gatekeeper too those uh, key, two keyhole inversions are are were slower than I thought and really gave some good hang time. And same thing with that final Val Raven inversion. I don't think that's an element that's that's on any other dive coasters. So that uh, definitely caught me off guard. According to RCDB, it is a zero G roll parentheses variant. So yes, whatever, yeah, whatever variant. I think being the the optimum turn there. Um, yeah. You know, you were there for three days, and I know in recent years, Cedar Point and Cedar Fair as a whole, they really put an emphasis on their their food. And, you know, we uh, we joke back and forth with uh, Justin over at uh, Fun Food Blog about, you know, the food at Cedar Point. Were there any uh, culinary highlights during your three days? Uh, well, it's funny you bring that up uh, because I only ate at the park once uh, because well, since we were there for three days, we just... Uh, got groceries and kept them at the hotel, which, by the way, I've never done. Highly recommend it if you're going on a coaster trip uh, because, it's first of all, it's going to be cheaper and it's also um, going to – it's nice to to get back to the hotel a couple times a day. I mean it, it really only makes sense if you're staying somewhere like Breakers that it's literally a two-minute walk from the park. Mm-hmm. Um, but the one place that we did uh, – we did eat in the park um, – I am blanking on the name of it, but it is, uh, it was like, um, uh, we, we might have to cut this out. It's, it's in frontier town and is it, the, is it backbeat Q? Is it the saloon? Not, no, not backbeat Q. It's, um, in between Maverick and still vengeance. It's, it's right near Maverick. It's like a saloon. I, I, we went there too. I can't remember the name of it. People sort are, of, yeah. People are yelling at their phones anyway. Go ahead. Yeah, let me. Uh, okay, hold on. I can look it up w- while I talk about it, so I can get the right name. But um, uh, it was very good. It was real food, like it felt like real, uh, like cooking, which was nice. Uh, they had like hand breaded uh, chicken, which is what I got, uh, and it was very, very good. It came with a um, a side and a biscuit, so I got the um, potatoes, fried potatoes, which were delicious. Um, and it, uh, what I like, I always like this, especially in theme parks, cause you don't see it as much where they actually are cooking the food. Like you can see them like roasting the chicken or, uh, frying and seasoning the potatoes, which was nice too. Uh, so that was good. Comes with a biscuit, which is always a nice touch when they, uh, throw something else in there too. So yeah, I was impressed. Oh, it was called, uh, the farmhouse kitchen and grill. So gotcha. I would recommend it. Um, if you're there, I think that uh, that would be a good option. Uh, it was filling a lot of food for the price. So, yeah, that gets a thumbs up for me. All right. Well, you know, it's smart. I love the, the economic play by you um, to, you know, save a little bit of money. And it was. Oh, and yeah. Coast, coaster trips can get expensive. And yes. So um, what about some other uh, Cedar Point highlights? I know, you know, they've got the Cedar Downs racing carousel, which is pretty unique, but anything else that you experienced in the park that you know stands out or was a highlight for you 
Yeah, I mean, really, uh, to be honest, we only did the coasters, uh, so I did not okay. get to do any of the flat rides. Uh, I did a sky ride, actually. Sky ride was a nice one. Uh, really short, actually. <laughs> like, it's it's almost definitely faster <laughs> if you just walked. Uh, but if you have time, the views uh, are really, really nice. Uh, okay. It's right across that main midway. So uh, you, you get a view of pretty much all the coasters that are in there. Uh, gotcha. But something, probably the surprise of the trip for me, was Magnum XL 200 uh, because I went in with no expectations. In fact, I went in with expecting not to like it because typically um, uh, arrows are not my favorite. And the only comparable coaster I've done is Steel Force at Dorney Park, which I was not really impressed with. Different manufacturer, but similar clearly layout and look. Uh, but Magnum XL 200, my first ride was in the, the second to back row, I think, which was good. And I was impressed already. But then uh, I went in the magic seat, which if you don't know, is car number one, row number three. Uh, And maybe the strongest airtime I have ever experienced, which completely took me by surprise. Those last couple of hills, even the first big one. But I mean, those last small triangle hills, as they've come to be called, I mean, I have never experienced anything like that. I mean, you are quite literally being thrown into the restraint, and I couldn't have loved it anymore. I, another thing, another coaster enthusiast. Yes, you have to ride in this exact seat in this train. Uh, yes, exactly. It, it's. I mean, no, no, the ride is good. The ride is good without it. But if you want the insane airtime, you got to go in the magic seat. The magic seat, third row, car one. Right? Yep. Okay. Yes. You gotta remember that for next time. I just I think Yeah, it's uh it's incredible. So yeah, we have whippiness, we have magic seat <laughs> magic seat, yeah. Coast, coaster enthusiasm is zero G roll variant. Yeah. We're just we're throwing all the terms at you right Key now. Keyholes. Yes. So okay. Now, now that we've we've covered kind of a three day whirlwind tour of of Cedar Point, <laughs> yes, you know they have um, at the time uh, sixteen operating roller coasters. Did <laughs> yes. did you get all sixteen? Uh, I got fifteen, so I did not do the one of the kitty credits. You can't ride unless you have a kid with you, so I didn't do that, um, and I did not do the other like family coaster. Okay. Um, I don't know if it, there's two. There's Woodstock Express and there's another one. So I'm not sure which one it was. But Wilderness Run, I believe it is what it's called. Yes, it's yeah. Wilderness Run I did not do. Um, and if you're Cedar Point, then you count uh, Pipe Scream as a credit. I do not. Uh, but it also wasn't open, which was funny uh, because we saw uh, all of the mechanics. Every day we saw all the mechanics working on it, uh, which, you know, that is another Zamperla uh, creation. So... Uh, I'm sure that they were also working on Top Thrill 2 at the time, but it was funny that uh, that is the <laughs> Zamperla that we saw under maintenance. So I didn't do that one either, but uh, I got 15 new credits on this trip, which is a pretty great amount for any coaster trip. So I think so. I was very satisfied with, with my 15 new credits. That's right. 50 yeah. total coaster rides over three days. That's pretty good. That's yeah. especially for the park being busy those two days. Yes. But at its core, with with Cedar Point being this theme park mecca, um, did you uh, did you feel like it lived up to every expectation you'd ever had, and for every book and every YouTube video and every <laughs> Travel Channel documentary you'd ever seen about Cedar Point, did it live up to your expectations? Uh, in terms of the coasters, definitely, definitely. I mean, this is one of the strongest coaster collections out there. Um, in terms of the park itself. I mean, this was the first week of full week operations, so I, I need to take that into account too. Uh, I go into it a little more in depth in the article, but there were some things that that were, uh, I think, a little below. At, I mean, the biggest thing is uh, there is no shade in this park, specifically in the queues. Um, I mean, we saw three or four people actively pass out in the lines and needing like medical attention. So I definitely think uh, maybe... If if uh, Cedar Point would invest in some uh, queue coverings that would be 
nice. Uh, you know, the midways, you can't really do much about that, uh, but definitely the cues. And, you know, some of the operations were a little um, spotty too. But, you know, even if you take all that out, you still have an amazing coaster collection. So overall, I would definitely go back, especially because of, <laughs> I need to chop through it too. But even if not, Cedar Point is definitely one that uh, now that I've been once is going to be in my regular coaster trip rotation. There you go. That's that's all the sales pitch you need. I mean, if it, if you're down in Florida and can make a trip to Sandusky, Ohio, a regular thing. Yes. That's that's all you need to hear. Yep. Definitely. But on the subject of Florida, we're going to keep the uh, we got a first timer trend going here. Uh, you got to experience uh I think Florida's newest or probably at this point, the world's newest theme park land. Um, yeah. DreamWorks land at Universal Studios, Florida. And yes. for those who are unaware, uh, Universal Studios, Florida, when they opened in 1990, whatever that was, whatever year they opened, um, they had an area devoted to uh, Fievel, uh from the, the cartoon film An American Tale. Uh, Shane, you were significantly younger than I am, we, we, so we've we've hit our mark for every time you're on yes. the podcast yep. for me to Perfect. make this reference. Did you know what Fievel was? Did you like, uh, have no. any idea? Okay. I did not. I also had never uh, really – I mean I've been in the kid zone. I had never gone on the coaster though, which is okay. crazy. Uh, I had never done it, um, and I'd really only ever been in that land because – um, you have to walk through there for Halloween Horror Nights to get to some of the uh, houses. So that's the only reason I've been in there. So I had no attachment to the land at all, no nostalgia for it whatsoever. Okay. So it for for those who are, you know, have never been to Universal, they had a kind of a play structure that was themed to an American tale. They had a area that was like a show that was called The Day in the Park with Barney. And they also had kind of a water structure uh, for Curious George, which again, these are, I don't know if Barney's still on television, might be, but I feel like Curious George, very few kids know, unless they're reading bo- reading the books, which I'm sure still exist. But Fievel was kind of a dying, dying dead property. And then there was the Woody Woodpecker uh, Nuthouse right. Coaster, which has uh, come up with a new name and theme. But Universal in recent years has they've gone all in on their, their DreamWorks partnership. Uh, they used to have Shrek 4d and a Shrek meet and greet, but that is now moved to this new DreamWorks land, which also has some Kung Fu Panda. It's got trolls. Um, it's got a Shrek themed slide. That's also an outhouse, which is really funny, but, yep. um, you know, this, it is an area for kids. Let's, we'll go ahead and preface this because uh, that was the one thing I was seeing, like when people were reviewing it, it's like, why would they build a park for kids? And I mean, at its core theme parks are for families. So of course, not everything is going to be Velocicoaster or no, uh, I wish, but no, a, a major pro ride. But what were your, uh, what were your thoughts walking through DreamWorks land? I thought it was really great. I mean, I went in knowing what you just said. I went in knowing that this was not a land that was built for me. Uh, but every single a kid that was in the land just seemed to be having a great time. Um, the outhouse slide, I mean, so funny. It literally, technically, I could have gone in it, but I was uh, worried that I might not make it to the bottom because I, I'm a little tall uh, for the intended uh, audience for that. So I did not attempt to go in it. But I mean, what else do you want? It's a slide that you enter in and it plays farting noises while you're going down the slide. I mean, what, if you're a kid, what more can you want than that? And then you can leave the slide and meet Shrek. So that area is fun. Um, yeah, I I think, um, and I mean, this comes from the park who gave you a troll uh, walk around character who also oh, farted, yes. farted glitter. So, Actually, I mean, yeah. If you haven't seen it, please look up a video of Universal Studios farting troll. It's what it's what you think it's going to be, and it's very funny. It literally I, uh, farts glitter. We might not have a new name for this episode. A Coaster 101 podcast, Universal Studios Farting Troll. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Uh I don't actually I don't know if I don't think that's in the land. I think that was like a limited time thing, but they do have meet and greets there. 
Um, they have the Shrek meet and greet. Then they have um, – so the, there's a couple different areas. The Shrek area is sort of the first one that you see there. So there's the Shrek Swamp House, which is where they do the Shrek meet and greet. Uh, then there's the the outhouse slide, and it, which is built into this kind of outdoor play structure. Uh, there's a fun little uh, Pinocchio um, interactive element too where you press a button and he'll – Uh, tell you a fact and his nose will grow uh, if the fact is not true. Um, So that's a fun too. And in that area, there is the um, singing frog uh, symphony as well, which is fun, which are like pretty basic animatronics where you step on a lily pad and then the frogs will sing or talk. Um, I guess this is, I I don't know what the story behind this is, but uh, I guess they are uh, Budweiser frogs. So there are, three lily pads that if you step on them in order, the frogs will say Budweiser. So I don't know the story behind that, but I know that it's a thing. Uh, so that's there. Then they've got the trolls area. Um, so there's like a little, another outdoor uh, play structure. And then probably what most people listening to this podcast will be interested in, which is the troller coaster, uh, which is the retheme of the uh, Woody Woodpecker's not house coaster, which I'd never done. So this was a new credit for me as well. Um, so I got to try it. It's a pretty good coaster. Um, it's, I believe a mirrored clone of barnstormer at magic kingdom. So, um, it's a Vacoma uh, family slash kitty coaster, which is, it's exactly what you think it would be. The trains are fun. Um, there's, you know, it's bright colors. So kids will like it. Uh, have you been on this Andrew? I have ridden it. It's, it's been a little bit. Um, I, uh, it's one of those, I feel like as an adult, you ride and as a coaster enthusiast, you take your, your personal shame and you ride it and you don't have to ride it ever again. And again, as a childless, um, 30 something, it's, I don't actively seek out kitty coasters more than once usually. (laughs) Yeah. Me neither. The pictures I've seen of this thing, the trains just look unhinged i feel like is a good way to put it the definitely catter, the catter bus they're just kind of scary scary looking but you know i'm i'm excited it's i'm glad they didn't take it down i mean yeah if they me had too. taken it down they could have built a new kitty coaster which would have been a new credit which is always a good thing hmm, right the thing the thing i would miss most about this land is back tucked behind the uh curious george water play area there was this area called the ball factory. And yes. You, you, you Did you ever go back there? I, again, I've walked by it because that's the queue for <laughs> HHN. Okay. So that was a great place just to go and just blow off steam because it had all these thousands of just foam balls and air cannons. And it was, it was a really hidden gem that you, I think I learned about it in like one of those like unofficial guidebooks when I was okay. like a kid. And I was like, I had no idea this was back here. And then it became like something I would have to do every trip. So I miss that. But it sounds like, again, the interactive elements with the Shrek play structure and the meet and greets Definitely. and the Kung Fu Panda training academy. Yes, it's, I did want to talk about that, too, yeah, because go, that go that is what you're saying. That is the Curious George. I mean, the structure is unchanged. So, which I didn't, I didn't realize this was outside because it, it's similar to a uh, turtle talk with crush or monsters Inc. laugh floor at um, magic kingdom where uh, that you're actually interacting with the screen character. I didn't realize it was outside. I figured it was inside, which is a kind of a cool spin on it, but like the structure is the same, like the upper balcony, you can't go on it anymore, but the upper balcony where you would shoot the, the foam is the same. Um, so they did a really good job with reusing the structure, but making it look completely different. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was also, I didn't get to see it yesterday because it was in technical rehearsal. So there, there wasn't a show um, for a little while when I was in there, uh, but they have a new indoor show, like a stage show, uh, which I'll definitely do at some point, um, which is great because, uh, you know, another, especially something to do inside is nice. A show for kids is, is always good to have too. So Uh, Yeah, overall, I think, uh, like I said, it seemed like all the kids in there were having a good time. And I think Universal is a park where if you're of the age that this land is geared towards, there's probably not too much that is going to appeal to you. So uh, I definitely think that this 
especially now that it has you know recognizable characters that kids will know and want to go meet and uh hang out in the area uh, i think this will this is a big win i think for universal i agree and you know again if you're mad about it it's a kid's land you don't have to go there it's tucked away no. in a corner of the park like if you want to go ride et and it's new beautiful sign great go ride et but right. you don't have to you can, go... yeah the, the sign is really nice yeah so and then the uh the last uh first timer uh, thing you actually went to yes despite living in orlando for a couple of years at this point you had yeah. never been to the uh the fun spot in orlando kind of right there off of international drive real quick i mean personally i love white lightning white lightning i think is a yes is a wooden coaster that nobody talks about that they really should and you know freedom flyer is fun as well but you know what were your thoughts on fun spot orlando before we wrap this up I thought it was um, pretty good. Uh, I re- I just went. I only did those two. I know they have a kitty coaster, but I wasn't going to pay for it. So I just did the two. Uh, but yeah, White Lightning was also my first experience with Titan Track. Um, I, I also, th- this is my own fault. I thought a majority of the coaster had Titan Track. Definitely not. Um, I, I've come to learn that it was just the first coaster that they put it on. Um, so it's really only on like that last uh, little portion there. You can definitely feel the difference, but even, even the rest of the coaster, I thought was really good. Again, I had never seen a POV, didn't really know much about it. Only had seen it while driving by to get to universal. Um, but yeah, white lining was, uh, was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I did it once I did it in the back row. Um, pretty smooth for a Florida wood coaster. Um, really pretty smooth for any coaster. I didn't find it rough at all. There's some interesting elements. There's a, a big double up that I didn't know about. Uh, there's a fun, a sort of uh, oddly banked, uh, tall turn that's cool. Um, but, so yeah, definitely. I mean, if you're going to Orlando or if you live here and haven't done it yet, definitely a good stop for White Lightning and uh, Freedom Flyer is fun too. Uh, they did get new trains, which are are nice. Um, very uh, um, open restraint which is nice especially on a coaster like that where you don't really need to over the shoulder or anything uh smooth fun ride uh overall good experience at fun spot yeah i i think fun spot it's it's a great add-on if you're in the area especially if you're at universal staying on site you know it's you're less than 10 minutes down the road depending yeah, on traffic. yeah right there um and it's a quick, you know, plus one, plus two, plus three, however many coaster credits you want to grab. But I think White Lightning specifically is a coaster that if you're in the Orlando area, you need to make time to ride this. Definitely. Because, yeah, I just it's it's a ton of fun. And who knows? You know, they keep teasing on Twitter and, you know, they could just have a overzealous social media person. Um, but, you know, maybe <laughs> they'll have an RMC one day. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. And, you know, RMCs, they're playing into it. And we know that RMC and Fun Spot have a history between the uh, 208 retrack on uh, um, Mind Blower and also Air Force One up at the Fun Spot in Atlanta. So, you know, maybe it's time to complete the trifecta. Who knows? Uh, that would be great. <laughs> so. All right. Well, Shane, any uh, before we wrap this up, any final thoughts on cedar point dreamworks or uh fun spot you know again you're you're crossing things off the list you're you're i am you're can't be a first timer at very many places anymore but no you know, no nope. fortunately in, a, in a, about a week's time you've done it three times yes which is great uh but yeah overall uh i had a great time with cedar point um as far as like first timer tips i mean i have the article on the website so definitely go check that out if you want a, a in-depth review of different aspects. Um, but I would definitely, if it's your first time, I would definitely recommend getting fast lane for at least one day. I think it's worth it. Um, hotel breakers. I said this in the article, but I don't think I would go to Cedar point and not stay there. It was just such, I mean, since Cedar point is built on a peninsula, it is a big inconvenience. If you're not staying there, if you have your own car, that's a different story. Um, but like for me, I would have had to Uber back and forth, which just would have been terrible. And especially, I mean, we saw every day the traffic was really rough after the park closed. So 
even just during the day, having the convenience of, especially because we were there, it was a uh, very uncommon for Ohio, but it was in the nineties when we were there. So it was very hot. So it was nice to be able to go back, take a break, eat some food. If you have some groceries like me, which I would also recommend. Uh, and then just having the ability to quite literally have a two minute walk. I mean, you're pretty much in the park. You have your own park entrance, which is nice. I never waited at all to enter the park. Um, and when top thrill two opens, that will be the closest entrance to top thrill two. So, um, Definitely big, big time first time tips. Uh, I would highly recommend it. Uh, it just really put a nice little bow on the uh, trip, which overall was great. I have a new number two favorite coaster in Steel Vengeance uh, and number four in Maverick. So um, I really uh, couldn't recommend it enough. And I cannot wait to go back to get that Top Thrill 2 credit. I love it. Well, like I said, Shane, let's let's plan this trip so I can get Steel Vengeance and Top let's Thrill 2. Let's do it. All right, we'll make it happen. That's going to do it for this week's episode of the Coaster 101 podcast. Uh, like we've mentioned a couple of times, uh, we've got, first of all, we've got a back catalog of just about 150 episodes. So if you like the sound of my voice or Shane's voice or uh, nerding out about whippiness and uh, <laughs> magic seats, uh, go check those out. But we also have a website, coaster101.com. A lot of great articles, including Shane's uh, first timer thoughts on Cedar Point. Yes, so I'll also have the- a coaster ranking coming soon if you want to uh, tear that apart uh, when it gets boasted uh, or agree with me, which would be even better. Uh, yeah, go. Uh, that'll be up soon. I love it. And we're on social media uh, at Coaster 101, pretty much anywhere you can consume the platform. So that's Facebook, Instagram, whatever Twitter's calling itself these days, TikTok. We've started being more active on TikTok. There's some reverse POVs we've had, uh, Loch Ness Monster and Good Gravy. So we're still, again, elder millennials, most of us, sorry, Shane, uh, trying <laughs> f- trying to figure out that platform. So, uh, but yeah, anywhere you can find social media, Coaster 101 is probably there. Um, if you're listening, make sure you're liking, rating, reviewing, subscribing, telling your friends. And um, it, we know there are people out there who are listening because people tell us they listen to the podcast. And our first response is, why? So, um, <laughs> so we appreciate you listening, but you know, we want to continue to grow that audience. And, uh, yeah, if you're looking for the latest and greatest coaster one one merch, uh, C one Oh one dot CO slash T public T E E P U B L I C. Uh, so there's some really good coaster one Oh one inspired and theme park inspired coaster one Oh one merch. They kind of go hand in hand there. And last, but certainly not least, Thank you so much to JMMD Entertainment for our theme music. Um, check them out. They're on the, uh, if you if you follow us on social, follow them on social. They've got uh, shows at Six Flags Great Adventure, uh, Lake Compounds, a couple other parks this, uh, this season. So be sure to check them out. Um, but yeah, Shane, let's, uh, let's make this a habit of having you on more than like once every like, Let's do months. it. Let's do it. There's always uh, stuff to talk about here in Orlando. So I love it. All right, that's going to do it. We will talk to you all again soon. See ya.